blue. I want to talk today a little bit about the center of things. This morning I was reading some poetry by Kabir and it's very beautiful. Kabir was a Sufi poet from the 1500s and somebody that um, early in my journey within that I found I've never read poetry like that before. <sighs> Extraordinary. I'm also going to talk a little bit about Stoicism. On my short journey into the sun I came across a man from 100 AD a former slave by the name of Epictetus I believe that Epictetus is one of the most profound, if not the most profound teacher in the Western tradition, philosophical, metaphysical tradition. He is so clear on life. And let's talk a little bit, Eric, just remember <laughs> um, what he helped you find. How to live a happy, fulfilling life. How to be a good person. You know, one of my initial questions to myself was, can I be a better person? I didn't think I could, but uh, philosophy, they say, is the cry of the soul. <laughs> and uh, at the time that my soul was crying, I found philosophy. And philosophy is not something, you know, everyone studies it a little bit in school. I didn't have a classical education, so I didn't ever get really any of the classics until I found them myself after college or in college. But when your soul cries out, there's an answer, is what I found. Epictetus was a Roman slave, and he became, he developed a very simple view of how to be a happy person and live a happy, productive life. So out of his work, the School of Stoicism was born, Philosophical School of Stoicism. Now, what's interesting about Epictetus is that many, he shunned all fame, and he shunned all, after he was freed, and after he had suffered a great, you know, horrible life, but he had risen above it, he did not become bitter. He turned it around, and he shared his philosophy openly. And it's a philosophy that's very kind. Um, people have this image of Stoicism as being a very stern, you know, view of the world. Um, but now, interestingly, Marcus Aurelius, who was one of the greatest Roman emperors, he was a student, maybe the greatest student of Epictetus at the time. Imagine a slave, Epictetus, sharing his simple wisdom to whomever would listen. And along comes a young Marcus Aurelius, or how, however he met him because of his renown, his simplicity, his effectiveness. 
Epictetus was effective. There's lots of crazy philosophies in life, you know. There's lots of psychotic and weird, crazy fantasy, crazy states of mind. And then there's the reasonable, normal, scientific states of mind. But Epictetus will ground you. His wisdom will ground you and yourself in a way that you will become unshakable, unfazable, calm when the moment requires it wise when you know it's needed quiet otherwise still it's about being effective in life so you know his prescription basically if i sum it up for the good life it kind of centered on three main themes i'm reading some of my notes mastering your desires performing your duties and effectively and learning to think clearly about yourself and your relations within the larger community of humanity. I'm going to read a short meditation from The Art of Living by Epictetus, an interpretation by Sharon LaBelle the classical manual on virtue, happiness, and effectiveness. What's very interesting about Stoicism, at least in its pure form from Epictetus, is, and by the way, if we don't know where his source came from, but I say it is very Eastern in its origin, um, and I'm sure there was a lot of mixing of these ideas in the, at that time, Zen, Buddhism, and Hinduism, you know, was bleeding over um, into the West. So, you know, uh, who knows? Um, I'm at, you know, somebody may know, you know, a scholar may know the history much better than I. So I, I'm only a layman. I'm a simple man. And that is the other beautiful thing about Epictetus. He felt, now he was obviously a genius of, you know, of amazing talent. But he broke his philosophy down into simple rules that the practical man could apply. And I would tell you this, I think, this is a prescription for what could help the world today. It's not only a manual for life, it's also a manual for leadership. The Art of Living is a manual for leadership. And it was originally called The Manual. The Manual. And soldiers would carry the manual into battle, into war because of its wisdom and its ability to be understood by the common man. So where, you know, if you've ever read the Tao Te Ching, which I would see as a comparable book to the manual, but from a Eastern perspective, written by Lao Tzu, I believe in 500, you know, BC, around there, 500s, um, Lao Tzu wrote a simple book, you know, basically, you know, ch called change, you know, the universe is change. And that he wrote some simple rules that would be used by many emperors in the Chinese, in the, in the Eastern dynasties. And they would, some of the emperors would become servant emperors. They would serve their people and see that their greatest job would be to assure the happiness and freedom of their people. And so they committed themselves to that purpose they took, they lived lives of, as aesthetics, which is to shun all outward comforts or to live a very simple life and integrated life in nature. And then they would take up art, as I have <laughs> found naturally. You begin to naturally form, your art comes out of you the way that the light is meant to shine through yourself you know a beautiful thing about the heart everyone has one even the mean people even the meanies and we all have facets into that in that heart like a jewel I believe within each of us is a diamond the hardest stuff in the universe and you can lit you can stand on that and I believe in a way Epictetus reaches inside without saying it he acknowledges that center, that, that diamond, that hard core, 
because he found that as he suffered you know so anyway we all shine i think with a different faceted light all equal all beautiful all important and epictetus said all people are important know that there needs be there need be no distinction between you there may may appear to be distinctions but those distinctions are only ones that we create ourselves and maintain through our participation in our common civilization and within that civilization is a hierarchy a hierarchy and the ha there are the haves and the have nots well obviously Epict epictetus was a have not in the beginning but he became the greatest the least shall become the last shall become the first the least shall become the greatest and you know in a way you could say that epictetus it was gave us the foundation solidified the foundation of law and justice and civilization in a way at least the western civilization and these are ideas that have been perverted and used and you know for many thousands of years but now but uh any I'll, anyway i want to read um from page 86 the first step um it's broken into simple meditations so you could read it as a daily meditation it's a beautiful book i highly recommend it the art of living the first step to living wisely is to relinquish self-conceit see the delusional folly in being a nervous know-it-all whose giddy mind is always prattling on about its knee-jerk impressions of events and other people forcing current experiences into previously formed categories oh yes this thing here is just like such and such it must be thus behold the world fresh as it is on its own terms through the eyes of a beginner to know that you do not know and to be willing to admit that you do not know without sheepishly apologizing is real strength and sets the stage for learning and progress in any endeavor the wisest among us appreciate the natural limits of our knowledge and have the metal to preserve their naivete they understand how little all of us really know about anything there is no such thing as conclusive once and for all knowledge the wise do not confuse information or data however prodigious or cleverly deployed with comprehensive knowledge or transcendent wisdom they say things like hmm or is that so a lot once you realize how little we do know you are not so easily duped by fast talkers splashy glad handers and demagogues spirited curiosity is an emblem of the flourishing life arrogance is the banal mask for cowardice but far more important it is the most potent impediment to the flourishing life clear thinking and self-importance cannot logically coexist humanity it has no inherent pecking order despite outward appearances everyone in the world is important if you really want peace of mind and success in your endeavors forego self-importance conceit is an iron gate that admits no new knowledge no expansive possibilities nor constructive ideas indulging in excessive pride in your own knowledge abilities or experiences and attempting to take on more power or authority than is your due is fatal such preening not only alienates others since an overbearing lout is suffocating to be around but also leads to complacency precluding change in a wholesome direction you keep running around in the in the same familiar circles you get caught in the same sticky webs nothing novel or festive ever happens stop jabbering like a magpie notice what's actually happening not just what you think is happening or wish were happening look and listen to do anything well you must have the humility to bumble around a bit to follow your nose to get lost to goof have the courage to try an undertaking and possibly do it poorly uh an aside as i am now oh, clearly back to the reading unremarkable lives are marked by the fear of not looking capable when trying something new new experiences are meant to deepen our lives and advance us to new levels of competence they are not meant to be used by the self-important as fodder for shoring up their previously adopted views and conclusions 
Important knowledge and personal guidance dwell in unexpected places. If you wish to see them and avail yourself of them when you come upon them, then guard yourself lest you become vainglorious and uncritically smug. The legitimate glow of dissatisfaction at accomplishing a hard-won worthy goal should not be confused with arrogance, which is characterized by self-preoccupation and lack of interest in the feelings or affairs of others. Wow. Wow. Um, if anyone knows me personally that might be listening to this silly prattling on, you know me to be a prattler from my past and my present. And I would say, I'm sorry. Forgive me. You know, I wasn't, I don't try to be arrogant. I share out of wonder. And I'm often taken, I think, arrogantly, smugly. I've been reading the teachings of Don Juan by Carlos Castaneda. And we'll talk about that another time. <laughs> But there are four enemies, he notes, Don Juan notes, that all, he says shamans, but I want to say all people, I think he says all people have to face in life. And they are, one of them is power, another is clarity, old age, <laughs> and your own, depending on yourself, fear, basically. <laughs> the greatest of all, the greatest enemy of all, fear. And Epictetus is an example of conquering that fear. And Don Juan, who may or may not have existed, is also an example of a character who conquered that fear. And I would tell you that there are times when I am certainly afraid but I know the diamond within me and I know that I'm unbreakable <laughs> and when I doubt and when I'm losing my mind I can go back to that place I can stand there and there are flowers in that place <sighs> a tree trees beautiful fragrance and music they say it's nothing in the sun inside of you but what I found was a sky that just goes farther and farther and farther and the farther you let yourself fly the more that you bring back <laughs> and what is it that you're bringing back well Epictetus says there's nothing to really bring back. You're it. You're here. This is it. Your life. <laughs> so. I'll, uh, I'll leave it there for Epictetus and Stoicism for now. We will... Uh, I'll get back to it and explore it more. Perhaps with some random meditations. I found the last one profound that I'll end again by saying if you knew me or know me, um, that entry pretty much, you know, describes me. And I want to mention also that, uh, very much so, I've mentioned this before, Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, in the Serenity Prayer, is based primarily on Stoicism. And Stoicism is just distilled common, you know, wisdom. It's nothing that profound. It's just common sense, you know? You know what to do if you stop, look around you. You don't need you you don't need to worry about anything outside of yourself that you can't control. You can only control your actions and reactions. And my friends, chant that as a mantra. Every day, get up. Remind yourself of those things that nothing is your or anybody else nor anybody else is your problem and that you have no problems. You can always go back and rest at that place that you are only responsible for your actions and reactions. You know, I don't have a religion, but that would be my way of being, my way of living happily and being free. 
And in this place of freedom, I have to be very honest. It, I found peace. And the only reason that peace ever goes away is because I scare it off like a bird. Because I come running in like a child. And I'm learning slowly to, to walk slowly and to not scare the bird away when I come upon it, but instead slow enough and quiet enough to put out my finger and let the bird fly to my finger. And if you're very still, slowly move your finger to your ear and the bird will whisper to you things that you could have never dreamed of. <laughs> Epictetus also grounds us in nature, and he encourages us to really look at nature for the patterns of how to live and be. So, if you have no God, or if you have a God, um, it doesn't matter. Because at the end of the day, you're the one here living this life. And if you want a manual for how to do it, there's a lot out there. There's a lot of people telling you, that, trying to say that they have the truth. But the truth is only found within yourself. And this manual that I've mentioned, The Art of Living by Epictetus, I'm telling you something. It is a manual for finding happiness and freedom. And I wish that to all of you. <laughs>